Good morning. Welcome to the International Conference on Geographical Studies 2023. The theme of this year's virtual conference is Performative Geographies, Spatialities of Embodiment, Performance, Ideology, and Practice. My name is Kathy Lustre, a member of the Philippine Geographical Society Board of Trustees, and I will be the host for the opening ceremonies of the ICGS 2023. Now, for this opening ceremonies, we would like to express our very warm welcome and appreciation to our conference attendees. And we will do this through a series of welcome messages from the organizers, the Philippine Geographical Society, and the UP Department of Geography, and our special guest speakers. The PGS has worked in close collaboration with the UP Department of Geography in planning and organizing the ICGS. Within the UP system, the Department of Geography is part of the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy. To give a welcome message, I am honored to introduce the Dean of CSSP. Please welcome Dr. Ruth Lusterio Rico. A pleasant day to all. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 International Conference on Geographical Studies hosted and organized by the Department of Geography, College of Social Sciences and Philosophy, University of the Philippines, Diliman. First of all, my heartfelt congratulations to the Department of Geography for organizing this international conference. I understand the challenges and difficulties in organizing such an event, so I commend the hardworking faculty and staff of the Department of Geography for this undertaking. The Department of Geography is one of the eight departments of the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy. The college takes pride in having as one of its academic units the only Department of Geography in the country. The faculty in the department are not only recognized experts in their own fields of specialization, but they are also engaged scholars who extend their services to local governments and communities. The networks established by the department is truly commendable. I am therefore very confident to say that the Department of Geography contributes significantly to the realization of the college's vision to be a world-class center of excellence in teaching and knowledge production in the different social sciences and in philosophy, and of the college's mission to help shape UP students to be engaged a scholar ng bayan, guided by the values of honor, excellence, and compassion. I really find the conference theme quite novel and interesting. I am sure that the presentations will be stimulating and will be enriching the minds of all the participants. I wish you all a successful and fruitful conference. And that was the heartfelt message of Dr. Lusterio Rico for our ICGS 2023. This conference is a collaborative effort of the PGS and the UP Department of Geography. To welcome everyone to, year, to this year's conference, I would like to introduce the chair of the UP Department of Geography, Dr. Joseph Pallis. Thank you very much, Kathy. Good morning to everyone and welcome to the 2023 ICGS. In the last few years, and in, uh, and in close sponsorship and partnership with the UP Department of Geography, our conference themes reflect our own response to the shifts and changes and, trans and transitions of our life worlds. During the height of the pandemic, we offered a space to engage with geographies of care that are happening in our midst and in the various caring landscapes that emerge from the virus scene. The stories were as sharp and perceptive as they are emotional and in some cases even heartbreaking. We also wanted to capture the emotionalism of academic discourse, so we programmed Emotional Geography as our next conference's theme the following year. Emotions were as varied 
then as now, as we grapple with our individual lives, our caring responsibilities to our collectives, and our commitment to various advocacies. This year, we thought we will highlight the ways of making do and acting out, as Judith Butler advocated many years ago, in performing and enacting identities, practices, and ideologies, hence performative geographies. We solicited stories from you and got a wonderful collection of different intellectual and practice-based provocations and interventions spanning multiple scales that resonate deeply with your own versions of worlding and world-making. This, year, this year's theme focuses on specialities of embodiment, performance, ideology, and practice to capture a spectrum and to unpack the complexity and instability of performances and performed spaces. I enjoin you all to listen to stories and participate in several panel sessions that show intersections with historiographies, environmental humanities, theater studies, visual anthropology, and other lenses, methods, and discourses. We welcome you all to our two-day conference and hope that beyond these two days, we can count on you as partners and allies and create fruitful spaces of collaboration and collective action. Let's have a productive two-day conference. Mabuhay tayong lahat, padayon geografia. Thank you, Dr. Pallis, for sharing about your insights about the theme and calling us to action to study and become more involved in the discipline of geography. In preparing for this conference, the PGS collaborated with other organizations as, um, such as the UP Department of Geography, as well as the Philippine Social Science Council. It is a privilege to introduce the Executive Director of the PSSC. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Lourdes Portus. Thank you so much, Kathy. <clears throat> so I'd like to greet the Dean of the College of Social Science and Philosophy, Dr. Ruth Posterior. The Chair of the Department of Geography, Dr. Joseph Pali, President of the Philippine Geographical Society, Dr. Eman Garcia, the 2023 IGS Conference Coordinators, Prof. Timothy James Cipriano, and Professor Maria Celeste Arimida, participants of this uh, conference, ladies and gentlemen. Wonderful morning to everybody. I have been counting, and this is my third time to address the PGS International Conference. So I congratulate and applaud you for your consistency and a much, much active role in promoting geography and its multifarious dimensions. As I do not know much about geography, you always surprise me. It's time you craft your well thought out themes that have been mesmerizing me for the last three years. The theme of this conference, Performance Geographies, Specialities of Embodiment, Performance and Practice, including the past ones on care and emotions, reflects PGS response to a rapidly changing landscape of your discipline, a new performance paradigm, hybrid repertoire, profound political and economic shifts, and strong correlations between and among geography and the various advocacies in society. Surely, by producing performative geographies, we assume multiple meanings of geography. We now apprehend it not as a lineup of maps and earth topographies and layout, but the construction of images, meanings, structures, and landscapes that refuses to be conceived as having unilateral, fixed, or stable definition. As you describe the theme of the conference, geography has penetrated almost in almost human endeavors and concerns. It has permeated in various societal issues such as climate and the environment, sex and gender, care and emotions, health and the pandemic, political conflicts, and extreme poverty. Such trajectories and approach to thinking in your discipline attest to the cross-cultural lure of the human imagination and manifest a strong correlation and intersectionality between and among geography and society's movement, ideas, 
milieus, and relationships. I see your use of performative geographies as both a framework and a methodology that guide and inform your studies. This is palpable when your colleagues presented their papers at the PSS's 10th National Social Congress last July. The papers show what I have mentioned earlier as the interoperability of a range of themes involving food security, environmental volatility, disaster risks, and other challenges to society's welfare. In these papers, we saw the possible interventions of geographers with their spatial analysis, geonarratives, participatory mapping, and community-oriented approaches. I was surprised even community pantries during the pandemic related geography as Professor Oni Martinez explored the spatial relationships of inequality, population density, and access to amenities in accordance with location and varying relationships. Our LMS awardee, Dr. Timothy James Cipriano, presented another perspective of geography with its na narratives of environmental care and grassroots organizing in San Mateo Rizal. Of course, Prof. James Romcadag, meanwhile, drew our interest in his participatory methods and tools for mapping and spatial representation of disaster risk by, for, and with PWDs, making disaster risk assessment and eventually disaster risk reduction more inclusive. Finally, Dr. Joseph Palis introduced us to this method of world building or life world stories, which highlight the intersection of power, place, and human agency. I was in the audience then and was amazed at how far geography has uniquely innovated. I enjoy the trajectories that geographers are heading into. I wish these papers had been included in the upcoming PSSC book on health and wellness in the social sciences. So you see, in this NSSC, we saw that PGS is very much a part of PSSC. Not only that, some of you participate in our committees. I remember Dr. Pali's active involvement in crafting our BMG and Prof. Oni representing us in the Association of Social Science Research in Vietnam, as well as in helping us in our committees. Of course, the, your Dr. Cipriano is now included in PSS's roster of grant winners. One thing we are excited about, though, is to see your journals come out regularly. I think another volume will be ready for launch during this conference, and that will be another reason to salute you. Again, I congratulate PCS, a successfully evolved organization, for keeping alive the discipline of geography and for continuously mounting your international conference, which is really not a mean feat. So with the leadership of Dr. Garcia and with all the stress and overtime work to organize this conference, I am sure your participants will get the most out of this conference. I pay tribute to the men and women behind this momentous event. Mabuhay kayo. PSSC will always be proud of you. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Dr. Portus, for the continued support of the ICGS, the PGS, and of course, the discipline of geography. Sobrang na-uplift po ang aking feeling with your wonderful, wonderful message. This is the third year that we are conducting the ICGS in a virtual environment. Each year, the PGS is at the helm of organizing the conference activities. Leading the vibrant and dynamic team is the president of the organization. Please welcome Professor Emmanuel Garcia, president of the Philippine Geographical Society, who will give his welcome message. Thank you, Ma'am Kati. Um, before I be, uh, give my welcome message, I would just like to acknowledge Ma'am Odette. Ma'am, thank you po for always supporting PGS in all our endeavors and grab it. performance level. <laughs> welcome message ni Ma'am. <laughs> thank you again, Ma'am. All right. Um, in 2021, we highlighted the geographies of care. Last year, we focused on emotional geographies. Following the successes of these innovative and trailblazing themes, I am delighted to welcome everyone to the International Conference on Geographical Studies 2023. Performative geographies, specialities, embodiment, performance, ideology, and practice. 
performativity connotes actions and implies um, implies influence. This is the core which ICGS 2023 intends to tackle as it highlights multiple forms of performativities and practices that engages geography as a broad and holistic discipline. ICGS 2023 boasts of a wide-ranging thematic discussions covered in two plenary sessions, 16 parallel sessions, 51 research presentations, and the soft launch of the 2022 issue of the Philippine Geographical Journal. Um, in addition, the annual assembly of the PGS and the election of its 2024 Board of Trustees caps the event. With this, I am extending my sincerest appreciation to the ICGS 2023 Ad Hoc Committee, to the 2023 PGS Board of Trustees, UP Department of Geography, PSSC, um, our junior members, the Junior Philippine Geographical Society, UP Diliman, our student volunteers, and to everyone who come together to ensure the success of ICGS 2023. I am excited to see and share with you the various performances to be presented in our conference. Thank you everyone for joining us. Magandang araw po sa ating lahat. Thank you, Professor Garcia, for always inspiring us to perform in this wonderful space in the discipline of geography. After hearing such inspiring welcome messages for our from our esteemed guests, we will now proceed to a presentation on what this conference is all about and how we are expected to interact and participate in this virtual conference. For this, please welcome one of the coordinators of the ICGS, Mr. Timothy James Cipriano. Thank you very much from Kathy and to all our participants and guests who are joining us in this year's International Conference on Geographical Studies. While the conference is being held virtually, we are looking forward to hearing your provocations and narratives of geography-informed practices in research, pedagogy, community-based work, and various advocacies that tackle the performative aspect of and in geography. On behalf of the Ad Hoc Committee and the Board of Trustees of the Philippine Geographical Society, we wish to express our sincerest gratitude to all of you for being part of this conference. To make the most of our ICGS experience, there are a few things that I wish to walk you through. First, we have the following house rules that govern our conference. Please be reminded to keep your microphones on mute during the session to avoid unnecessary background noise. Our plenary sessions will be simultaneously streamed in the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. Whether it's the plenary or the panel session you are attending, we would like to encourage everyone to participate in our discussion by typing in your questions, comments, and or reactions in the Zoom chat box. These will be read by our moderators during the open forum. Also, please note that the conference is being recorded for documentation purposes. Please take note that whenever you get disconnected from the main session, you can always rejoin by using the same link provided to you by our secretariat. Let us now proceed to our program. This year's ICGS will be a two-day conference that includes two plenary sessions and six parallel sessions. The plenary sessions will be streamed by the, uh, via the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel, while our panel sessions will be recorded for documentation purposes. Regarding the panel sessions, we will be using the breakout rooms here in Zoom. You can choose which session you wish to attend by joining that specific breakout room. If ever you encounter problems in joining our parallel sessions or have difficulties in moving in from one breakout room to another, please let our student volunteers and organizers know to assist you. The schedules of our succeeding parallel sessions, as well as the ongoing sessions, will be posted in our main room for your guidance. One of the highlights of the second day of ICGS is the General Assembly of the Philippine Geographical Society, which will happen on Saturday, November 25, 2023, which is tomorrow, by the way, 
from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Philippine Standard Time. During the Assembly, the 2024 Board of Trustees will be elected. As such, we are encouraging all members in good standing to attend our General Assembly and participate in the election. Members in good standing are those who have submitted their membership forms and have paid the membership fee. Please take note that the conference fee will serve as your membership fee for the upcoming year. The Junior Philippine Geographical Society, UP Diliman, will be facilitating the election. For more information on the nomination process, you can visit the official ICGS microsite at bit.ly slash ICGS 2023 site. You will be continuously updated as the conference progresses. Right after the PGS General Assembly, we will have a soft launch of the 2022 issue of the Philippine Geographical Journal. We would like to invite everyone to be part of this event as we showcase the works of geographers, scholars, and allies in the field. Finally, if you're posting about the conference in your respective social media platforms, don't forget to use the official hashtag of this year's ICGS, which is hashtag ICGS2023. On behalf of the Philippine Geographical Society, I would like to express our sincere gratitude for the support you have given us and for participating in this year's ICGS. May we have a fruitful two-day conference. Thank you, Mr. Cipriano, for sharing how we can make the most out of our experience in attending and participating in this conference. And that concludes the opening ceremonies of the International Conference on Geographical Studies 2023. The next part of the program is the first plenary session. I would like to introduce the moderator of the plenary session. He is the chair of the Department of Geography. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Pallis. Thank you once again, Kathy. Um... I, it is my honor and privilege to introduce the plenary speaker, the first of the two plenary speakers that we have for this two-day conference of the International Conference on Geographical Studies. Ola Johansson uh, is a professor of geography at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. He holds a PhD from the University of Tennessee. Ola is also the author of the book called Songs from Sweden, which was published uh, in 2020 by Palgrave Macmillan as well as a co-author of Sound Society and the Geography of Popular Music in e and the w World Re Regional Geography uh, textbook. This year, an edited volume called New Geographies of Music No. 1 by Paul Grib Macmillan came out, which was edited by Ola, Severan Gayard, and yours truly. Volumes 2 and 3 are coming out in 2024 that look at urban policies, live music, and various geographies of music. You can also watch Ola in one of the episodes of This Is Pop on Netflix, where he served as one of the experts on popular music. Friends, allies, let us welcome our plenary speaker, Dr. Ola Johansson. Okay. Thank you, Joseph, and thanks for the um, introduction. Let's see here. Here, there I am. Um, uh, so uh, I want to thank for the Department of Geography uh, at, at UP for inviting me, uh, particularly Dr. Pallis. Um, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm speaking to you from, from the campus here. Uh, I have, I'm here on a short-term sabbatical stay for, for about six weeks. Uh, and uh, the uh, the paper I'm um, uh, delivering here uh, this this morning is is actually a follow up to a paper that I I presented about a year ago on on, on this topic and and I've been working on some additional data and uh, the topic is is such that it it uh, is very suitable I think for the uh, the theme of the conference so. Um, I will uh, 
Okay. There. Uh, I'm sharing the screen with you. Um, it's correct. I see nodding faces. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, not just my face, but my, my PowerPoint here. And the uh, the title of the uh, the presentation, Rap Music and Landscape of Violence, Sweden Through the Lens of Global, Global Media Consumers. Uh, so uh, as, as a background here, while I am at an American university, I was born and raised in Sweden, and I've, I've maintained connection to, to Sweden um, for the last couple of decades, including its its music scenes and other aspects of Swedish society that relates to to music. Uh, so what I'm going to start with here, and um, uh, we have about an hour. I'll, I'll speak for maybe half of that period and allow for some questions and and, and answer sessions after that. Uh, it, this this talk is based on a particular event, uh, a, a media event, uh, in in fact. A crime, a shooting. So, so here's the story. I'm going to tell that first before I'm getting into my my uh, my interpretation of, of this particular event, uh, and that is that uh, in the, the evening of October 21, 2021. So that's just about two years ago. Uh, a person walks up to uh, Sweden's best-selling rapper, uh, Einar, uh, outside his residence in Stockholm and shoots him at close range. Um, Einar dies. The murder remains unsolved, but is widely assumed to be gang-related. Right? Here's a picture of the police in the aftermath of the shooting and, and Einar, the rapper, in the lower picture. So this is the events to garner some international media attention. Um, a shooting of a musician in itself is high profile, but it also then importantly gets tied to a, a discourse of something else, that is of increasing crime in Sweden associated with guns and gangs. Uh, but also what made it um, quite uh, important for, for international media was another backstory. And that was, in fact, that that uh, Einar was uh, kidnapped two years, um, one year prior to, to his shooting. Uh, in, in fact, Einar had an alleged affiliation with a gang in Stockholm and a rival gang that also allegedly Count two other rappers among his roster, kidnapped Einar, held him hostage, filmed the ordeal, posted it on social media as a form of public humiliation. Uh, subsequently, the other two rappers were sentenced for the kidnapping. Um, here's a, a picture of, of this as reported afterwards in media. Uh, but then later on, uh, Einar was called as, as a witness to, to some of the events that transpired. But before he uh, entered the trial as a witness, he was shot. Okay, so so hence, this is the, the important backstory why this was very appealing to, to media, as I said, beyond Sweden. Uh, as a little bit of a background to the person in question here, the main protagonist, Einar, his, his, his name is Nils Grönberg. Uh, Einar is his middle name that he uses as as uh, his artist name. He was only in fact oh, 19 years old when he got he got shot. He, he's very much a social media uh, creation in terms of his music. Uh, he started posting videos; they went viral via via YouTube. Uh, later on, racked up tens of millions of streams in Spotify. Uh, he's rapping in Swedish, the Swedish language, so. His music has been limited largely to the Nordic countries, but he became a number one best-selling artist. And of course, that commercial success also heightened the crime's significance. So in the, um, in the previous paper that I alluded to about this event, I invested media narratives on the reporting of Einar's case based on news articles from around the world. 
So I traced the origin of those texts, um, what stories were told, how they were told, uh, and how they portrayed a, a, a story and narrative of social change in Sweden and one of, of increasing uh, violence. Now, for, for the purpose of, of this paper here, I dug a little bit deeper. Uh, and in fact, I focused on one of those news reports that came out of New York Times. You can see here this happened in January 2022. Uh, and uh, not so much looking into that particular news article, but rather uh, what happened was that that the readers of New York Times then made commentaries as a response to what they have read. And I analyzed that material of media. Media consumers collectively construct imagined geographies of rap music. If we go back here, this was specifically the article in question uh, that we can see here. Of course, the New York Times is one of the leading news outlets in the United States. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, before I get into the data itself, I want to say a few things about the theoretical background to my research here as, as well, relatively quickly. Uh, I, as, as Dr. Pallis was uh, mentioning in his introduction, I've been focusing on music in terms of my, my research uh, and, and the area of, of geography or geographies of, of music. Uh, some areas of geographies of music that are relevant to this particular presentation includes how music diffuses, uh, the fact that there are different regional styles in different places, the aspects of territoriality in rap. It's, it's the form of music that often is very tied to specific ter territories, often very specific neighborhoods that, that rappers represent and where they come from. And the fact then that rap music is, is also fairly strong in marginalized communities around the world. Uh, also important here are the concepts of deterritorialization and re-territorialization. So the idea here is that deterritorialization uh, is the loss of this traditional relationship between a particular culture uh, and the social and geographic territory that it comes from. So deterritorialization embodies the deep transformation of our everyday everyday cultural experience as, as, as local uh, beings. Uh, so this uh, has a connection, obviously, I think, to, to rap music, that severed connection of the cultural form uh, to a particular place. Rap originated not just in the United States, more specifically in New York City, uh, but then also then has spread to uh, lots of other places uh, across space and, and time. But when that happens here, rap music become re-territorialized. Its constituent components of rap become reworked into something else in the context of a local culture, where again, they begin tied to a particular place, a location, such as the way rap happens and is performed in, let's say, a suburb of Stockholm, Sweden. Media, of course, also play an important role here in the and re-territorialization, the way the public understands that. Um, a couple of other important ideas here uh, in, in terms of, of understanding this particular issue is the mediatization of the event that surrounds the ANR shooting, uh, what we can call landscapes of, of violence, which is a term that is used in different contexts, such as how political power and the use of force takes place uh, or uh, uh, memorializations of, of past events. But here I think about landscapes of violence, particularly in, in, in the context of contemporary urban environments. In the words of anthropologist Thomas Hall, I quote, the terrain and fabric of the city can partake in violence. The urban landscape is something that cannot easily be detached from encounters and experiences taking place within and across uh, these urban landscapes." End quote. Uh, so in, in other words, these landscapes can both be 
concrete or they can be symbolic places associated with, with, with violence. Uh, lastly, the, the mediated relate, uh, reaction to rap is also associated with performativity. Uh, and, and rap has its certain specific performative characteristics. Here, performativity, we, we can think of it in this context uh, as uh, having important elements of identity that is constructed through commonplace speech acts, nonverbal communication, bodily practices that produce meaning. Um, performativity can be planned performances or it can be the informal everyday practices. And of course, the world of, of rap musicians then that the public get to know is based on these types of performativity, hand movements, verbal communications, face associations, dress codes, and so forth. Now, uh, with, with that said, and I connect to this as I get to the, uh, the data material, the ANER uh, event, uh, a, a, a brief comment on methods here. So, uh, I basically engaged in a form of content analysis uh, here. So the, the number of reader posts that came from the New York uh, Times article were 241, all written in English. Occasionally, some individual posted more than once in response to what somebody else said. Um, uh, most of the posts were from North America, from the United States, a few from Europe, a few from Sweden. Uh, based on where those commentaries said that they were from, which they were required to do by New York Times. Uh, when I, I engaged in this content analysis, I organized the comments into five discursive, discursive themes. Uh, and I, I was trying to come up with a way to represent that. And this is, I'm sorry, this is the best that I could come up with. It focuses, of course, on rap music and the response among the readers to rap music. But then also four other things that intersect with all the other elements, issues about crime, issues about immigration to Sweden, the social milieu of particularly the immigrant suburb, and then other aspects of globalization then that creates a particular outcome here that we can connect to this event, rap music, and so forth. So, so that is the way I was envisioning or thinking about interpreting the, the, the Aner killing. So, so first here, uh, talking a little bit about rap music, uh, some of you may have may not be that familiar with it. But it was pretty clear here that the readers on New York Times constructed their own discursive ideas about rap music. It was often then critiqued on aesthetics, gra aesthetic grounds. Uh, but whether rap is good music or not is, is really of no consequence uh, here for, for, for the, the analysis. But needless to say, most of the people that made comments were not really fans of the genre. Uh, they also exhibited some limited knowledge sometimes about rap music, such as the nuances of different styles of, of, of rap. Of particular importance here is the subgenre of rap referred to as gangster rap. Uh, this, this is something that came out of the 1990s uh, and, uh, and here portrayed as, uh, as, as, as a defunct style of, of rap music, something that was common a couple of decades ago, but less so now, but not something that the readers not too familiar with rap necessarily picked up on. Uh, so <clears throat> the importance of that is that the thrust of the comments was an imaginary diffusion of, of rap music here that gangster rap is old school rap in the United States now found new fertile ground somewhere else, okay, in a different way. It has been deterritorialized and re-territorialized. Uh, and then in some ways, Sweden is somehow, quote unquote, behind in the development here, both in terms of musically adopting gangster rap now in the 2020s, as well as, as we will see later, seeing a surge of gang violence 
something that the American readers have been familiar with in the United States far longer than the Swedish experience. Uh, it is, in fact, so that, that rap music in general has become popular in Sweden far more recently than in the U.S. and has over the last, let's say, 10 years become probably one of the most popular forms of popular music. Here it says, pardon me, this is not in English, 19 of the songs on Spotify of the top 50 are, are Swedish rap in, in the Swedish top list on, on Spotify. Now, also importantly here <clears throat> is also conveyed through the comments is the universi universality of the appeal of rap music. And this is a key here in that it allows rap to be de and re-territorialized. Re uh, that is that the appeal of rap is not just limited to a particular social milieu, let's say the immigrant suburb, but it's broadly popular among different socioeconomic groups. And as some reader says, to support certain types of males, which, which in essence what they mean is that youth everywhere had this tendency to rebel, attract to what is perceived as dangerous, provocative, not accepted by society and standard norms, and also then uh, adopt the performative norms of, of, of rap. So because then this is perceived as, as I said, a universal um, uh, uh, expression of, of youth culture, it is then something then particularly with regards to rap that makes it easier to allow it to be de and be territorialized and become popular in many different contexts. Now, the second thing here then is the intersection with, with rap and violence, one of the most discussed topics among the different postings at New York Times. So many of the comments addressed uh, the cause and effect of rap and violence. Does rap only portray violent realities or does it actually encourage and contribute to violent behavior? Um, that's, that's an old debate. It, it's really as old as, as rap music and, and, and probably other forms of, of music as, as well. But it is an important example of how the commentators here think about the issue uh, in often a deterritorialized manner, because many of the comments did not really address the Swedish context. They were basically discussing the connection between rap and, and violence in, in a very general way. It was often, at least by some comments, quite deterritorialized. Uh, but at the same time, as, as one person stated, although not in these exact words, rap and gun-related crime come from the same landscape of, of, of violence, no matter what the cause and effect is. Uh, others saw gun culture in rap that has been replicated in Sweden in a similar fashion then to rap music becoming re-territorialized in Sweden. But on a deeper level, other commentators said that crime in itself is, is also ubiquitous in the sense that humans are under certain circumstances prone to violence without you know, delving deep into the psychology of, 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 of that. Uh, but then if we accept that premise, it's, it's crime then is something that, that it, it does not inherently that is not inherently attached to a particular place and, and therefore can and, and should be de or re territorialized. Uh, the, um, the image then of Sweden as a country, as a country of now deep change here, has been affected by not this particular story, but the larger context in which the ANR killing finds itself here as a new landscape of violence, a country in transition. Uh, but then these changes are presented in many different ways. Musically then from people that have musical associations with Sweden, maybe think of ABBA, the pop group of the 1970s, 
to perhaps different forms of, of heavy metal later on now to to rap music and it's some of its darker undertones uh as one person stated quote well, sweden always had good press now how did they hide their bad sides so well uh and end quote that now they see here or affected by by reading the new york times story some of the commentators also drew a connection here with rap crime then with uh, another form of popular culture emanating from not just Sweden, but all the Nordic countries. The so-called Nordic noir, a movement of crime drama on the screen and on television. Some of you I know know a bit about this, uh, but we can say that collectively this genre of, of, of film and television depicts variegated landscapes of, of, of violence in different places and different contexts, but some of them do focus on the immigrant neighborhood. I can think of at least two cases. Young Ballander is one story, and there's one called Snubba Cash that both depict what is largely then also seen here in the Aina story. Uh, but also uh, a couple of posts Via Nordic Noir have picked up on the internationalization of criminality in Sweden that is connected to some other European countries, primarily the former communist bloc. And that becomes important here because one big question mark that was repeated several times in, in the comments was, well, where do all the guns come from? Right? Isn't Sweden a place with tight gun control regulations where citizens just can't have handguns? That is correct. Well, so the answer is basically a black market where um, guns, handguns or military style weapons are basically smuggled into the country, largely from uh, Balkan countries where such weapons have circulated since the Yugoslav Wars in the 1990s. Uh, the, the source of violence and the reasons for it also was a question mark among many of the readers uh, but they also assume, correctly so, that control of the drug trade and so on is, is a, a driving force here. <clears throat> now, a third significant theme here is the issue then of immigration. Uh, because the close association here of rapid crime with the immigrant neighborhood. The New York Times article presented data on crime and ethnic status that showed indeed a uh, over-representation of people with immigrant background committing gun-related gun crimes. Uh, now, what do we make out of this? Um, uh, so in, in terms of, of immigration, uh, in, in a broader European context, the refugee migrant quote-unquote crisis started in the early 2010s with the Arab Spring, peaking around 2015. The images that we see here come from that period with an overwhelming amount of refugees entering Europe, many of them uh, arriving in, 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 in Sweden, that accepted a significant number of immigrants here. In fact, about 25% of the Swedish population now have a quote unquote immigrant background. Significant change with the recent past. <clears throat> So these global events or re world regional events, perhaps, uh, coincide here with, with the supposed increase in crime. So the two connected. But there's a little bit of problem with this kind of reasoning of crimes committed by, by, by immigrants. And, and here one issue is the lack of uh, government crime data that separates people born in Sweden and people who are not. And the reason why this matters is the online discourse connected here the high level of immigration to Sweden through its quote-unquote open border policy, which is not quite correct, but this then resulted in in the crime way then the, the, the logic assumption is that recent immigrants are responsible for, for, for this. Now this, as it turns out, really isn't correct. Um, uh, in that Almost all the gang members responsible for the violence are of well, immigrant background, but they're born in Sweden. Okay. Uh, the two other major 
characters in the story, the two other rappers that were accused of the kidnapping of Einar and possibly associated with the killing of him here, Yasin and Havel, they are depicted here in the middle and to the right, were both born in Sweden and not at all a product then of the 2015 immigrant wave. Um, now, the commentators then get involved with a lot of, of statistics back and forth about crime, uh, gang-related crimes, gun-related crimes, and so on. What constitutes, for example, a high level of, of crime, comparing it to other European countries, concluding that Sweden uh, is not that dissimilar from other European countries, maybe at the high end of some levels of crime, particularly gun-related. Um, it's a little bit hard if we want to go to basically cold, hard data, because crime data from country to country is not reported the same way and not very consistently, but here's a reasonable map from 2019. Um, gun debt Sweden has since 2019 increased a little bit, a little bit darker into perhaps the purple category. Uh, but a report from, from Forbes magazine, another U.S. publication, had a Swedish gun violent death rate at 0 0.4 out of 100,000. And uh, then some entrepreneurial readers, also in the New York Times article, uh, checked the U.S. one and found that, as you can see here, it's uh, easily 20 times as high in Sweden. So it's a matter of perspective. What is a high crime rate? What is a high uh, gun crime rate. Uh, also, a comment from another reader was, you know, not this is not the Sweden of the 1990s that we see. Now, back then, I would consider moving to Sweden, said one European commentator. Um, so, so this is a chart that I dug up myself about the overall crime rate in Sweden from 1990 until today. And as you can see here, it was actually higher back in the early 1990s than it is today. Another conflating in the readings is then about illegal immigration, that the increasing in crime here was used then as a tool to defend somebody's position that we need to have hardened policies on illegal immigration. But again, virtually none of the gang members are illegal immigrants. And besides, in the U.S. context, immigrants to the U.S., both legal and undocumented, actually have lower crime rates than native born Americans. So there's no inherent connection between the two anyway, in a broader sense. Now, the last couple of things I'll, I'll address here is then <clears throat> the discussion about the social milieu of uh, the immigrant neighborhood in Sweden. The uh, Commentators were focusing on whether or debating whether the New York Times article accurately portrayed marginalized communities. Here's a picture from a neighborhood, a suburb of, of Stockholm that is often seen that or meant to represent the, the immigrant rich neighborhood, which is probably have way over 90 percent people that are of immigrant background. Um, so is it showing a caricature exaggeration of daily life? Does it show a imaginary landscape of violence? To what extent does it show the reality? But then also connecting to, to rap, uh, the debate also then focused on, well, rap's performativity that deals with violence about posing with guns, use of gang symbols, is a performativity that may be as much profit driven as representing the reality of this on the street. One thing about the performativity of Einar that nobody picked up on, and that had to do with the fact that he's rapping in Swedish, is that uh, his, his rapping actually imitates the spoken Swedish of the immigrant suburb. Okay. So that's also a form of performativity, but not something that, of course, the English speaker the English speaking audience in New York Times understood real well. Now, one thing that they did understand was, and, and uh, I was looking for them to call Swedish immigrant neighborhoods, quote unquote, inner city, the US term basically for minority neighborhood in that they're found close to the city center. But 
Uh, nobody did so, which meant that the article probably effectively portrayed that the social ecology of European cities tend to be different, that the low-income high-rise suburbs is not at all found near the city center. Uh, of course, a, a lot of issues with the crime has to do with, far more importantly, issues that have nothing to do with rap, segregating housing markets, uh, labor markets, unemployment, lack of social capital among recent immigrants, language barriers, um, and yes, um, racism that they, they face, as discussed, for example, by uh, geographer Alan Pred here, depicting Sweden here as a country with an image in the past of, that was very positive and therefore using the term even in Sweden when discussing racism there. Uh, now, one complicating factor is that the lead character here, Einar himself, he is what I call the liminal protagonist. That means he crosses divides, floating across class, place, ethnicity, belonging. And then the fact that he was a middle-class white person. This muddies the waters in the reporting to not being able to very clear cut tell the story of violence and immigrant neighborhoods uh, here. Uh, in fact, also the place of the shooting further complicated the story in that most of the violence, these landscapes of violence are associated with the immigrant suburb, but this shooting happened at his residence and of course, as a wealthy rapper, he did not live in a poor neighborhood, but a rather nice one um, here, uh, which in some of the media, there was some confusion about its location, whether it was a suburb, not a suburb, or, or what the character of the neighborhood was. It's in fact a recently developed former industrial site that we see in many Western cities with new housing that are quite expensive. Aina's background was also quite complex. He did have a single mother, but she that that raised him. But uh, she was also a well-known stage actress. Uh, so he came from a prominent family in that sense. He misbehaved in school, possibly due to attention deficit disorder, involved in petty crimes, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> So his background was very different than some of the other rappers here. Going back to this picture again, here's a mugshot of the rapper Haval in, in the middle and a Facebook picture of Yasin, another rapper that was sentenced to the, for the kidnapping here. So these pictures circulated in media, New York Times or other media about the shooting, which then visualized their ethnicity. So in essence, the story of people of color shooting the white rapper. Now, lastly here, before I leave, um, I should also mention that some of the commentators also put this in a global perspective. You can think of it as a world systems perspective. Uh, that is that migration is really an outcome of a destabilized Middle East, uh, associated perhaps with U.S. intervention by migrants that have been pushed to Europe. I uh, hear U.S. paying for U.S. geopolitical uh, endeavors in part, perhaps. Global inequality leads to migration. Global neoliberalism here that causes mid-level jobs in, in Europe due to deindustrialization and automation is a root cause in that low-wage jobs are the only the ones now available to immigrants compared to the working class of the past. So, um, I want to conclude with, with that to leave uh, a little bit of, of maybe 15 minutes or so for uh, questions and answer on this particular topic. I'll stop sharing there and I'm, I'm back in, in, in person again. So that's it. Uh, Joseph. Thank you very much, Ola. Thank you for sharing with us your research and also very interesting uh, insights about the relationship of uh, rap music as it is situated both in the U.S. and in Sweden and also uh, within the context of the uh, 
landscapes of violence. If uh, you will, maybe before we entertain some questions, allow me to just uh, at least highlight a few points that I thought I thought would be interesting to raise anyway. Um, the, the first one has something to do with the space of the urban landscape, the space for performativity, which ironically is also the, the uh, a site for, for, for violence. But uh, you very uh, wonderfully articulated that there's no, there's not much direct correlation that uh, shows that violence um, enacted or performed were related to rap, even if there is uh, statistics that show that there is a rise in, in, in violence and also the uh, practice of rap as a, as a form of art. Uh, you gave us an example about how uh, the immigrant population, which is usually very open and very uh, receptive to rap music, as I'm, as I'm guessing, as, as the expression of those who are marginalized and dispossessed, there was never even a correlation about crime that was committed related to rap music. It seems that there is a universality of the appeal of rap, of rap like you said, because it affects and it appeals to various socioeconomic uh, groups. And, and uh, what I thought was uh, also interesting is how the landscape in the U.S. Uh, has somehow been replicated in Sweden. And we were just having a conversation among ourselves here. We're listening to your lecture about the context of rap in the Philippines as well. And we all affirm and also disagree in a lot of ways about how they were performed and enacted. But as my own studies with, with rap music from Khmer rap to French rap, uh, they are indeed uh, the expressions of those people who did not get some kind of mainstream attention but the but uh, have uh, uh, have become the basis for for if I may use a David uh, Henry Lefebvre uh, uh, quote here as a kind of their right to the city. So um, uh, thank you for sharing that with us and also for providing us a different context of rap uh, in Sweden as well as in the U.S. At this point, we would like to welcome questions. You could. Uh, what you can do, you could you could post the questions on Zoom chat. You could also raise your hand so we can I can acknowledge you. You can ask a question directly to Dr. Johansson, and uh, or you could send me a private message if you would rather not be uh, identified. Yes, FJ, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, I think this is more of uh, uh, this is more of an opinion. Uh, I'm asking for your opinion on this, but what do you think? is uh which spectrum is the is swedish politics uh turning towards because i feel like in this day and age there's a really big fear like uh among like among intellectuals or uh, progressives that there has been like a this like slow shift towards the right like we could see this in countries like hungary uh, countries like Turkey or even in the Philippines that uh, right-wing politics is using. Uh, I mean, rap music is one of those uh, issues, for example, that's like being used as a tool to uh, reflect or for like the state to like reflect on like uh, on this uh, decay of moral, uh, what do you call this, uh, moral uh, behavior. So I guess I'm curious as to what your opinion is on uh, if like Sweden is uh, possibly turning towards like a rightward shift in response to uh, these acts of violence. And uh, of course, the immigration policies that has proven to be really controversial and a subject of debate between like a left uh, left wingers and right wingers. Uh, yes. Thank, thank you for the comments, and uh, and uh, I, th I think my answer is not going to be very surprising. S Sweden has indeed uh, uh, moved towards uh, the political right for for many years. <clears throat> uh, interestingly, uh, just in the news yesterday, the uh, there was an election in the Netherlands, which is you know it's a country that is not very far, not very different from Sweden in, in some ways, where the anti-immigrant far right actually uh, 
came out ahead as as uh, the largest vote getter. The uh, what will happen in the Netherlands is to be determined in terms of the new government there. You mentioned Hungary as well. Um, so so the 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 answer is that the the Swedish anti-immigrant party uh, has has grown over the last couple of decades, year by by year. So they're now in a position where they are not in the government, but they affect government policy. Uh, so so they have as as a sort of a tiebreaker in parliament, been able to be quite effective in pushing the mainstream center right parties towards more of a sort of a, the punitive state approach to dealing with 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 gun uh, violence. So so I think that this is something that is is one of the biggest issues right now. Uh, in in Sweden has not declined since the shooting of of, of Einar um, about two years ago, but it 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 remains one of the the major issues in in, in Swedish uh, politics, uh, and uh, and and it involves, for example, some new proposals that would infringe perhaps on civil rights and so on in the name of of, of cracking down on. Uh, on violent crime, and 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 all of this is then clearly associated with gang crime, with with its association with immigrant uh, neighborhoods. So so yes, Sweden is is really not that different than uh, the populist movements we have seen all over the world. You know, from 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 Brazil to Turkey to Hungary, um, India, and so on and so forth. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that answers it. I hope. Thank you, Ola. Are there any other questions or, or comments? I was just remarking, Ola, about the recent news about Tupac Shakur's uh, assassin, supposedly, and and um, how the debate of finally finding or locating who killed him reignited the debate about violence again in rap music. Um, at least in the news that, that, that happened. It's almost like a kind of closure for many, but it for some reason, it also has the effect of giving a perpetuation that there is always violence when it comes to rap, whether warranted or not. Anyway, um, are there any other questions or comments that uh, anyone else would like to raise to Dr. Johansson? I could mention that, of course, the uh, the relationship between rap and, and violence is, of course, quite spurious. <laughs> uh, but um, but the Aina case was very convenient to debate this issue in that he was a rapper that got shot, and he was also referred to, you know, the the unraveling of long, uh, mythical, almost similar events in the United States that back to, back go back to the um, the high high period of gangster rap of the 1990s. Uh, another, another thing about the, uh, you mentioned the, how rap become very prominent in immigrant neighborhoods and, and just in society at, at large among particularly youth is, is I think that uh, what has happened is that social media and music consumption and the way that works has really changed things a lot that we have traditional gatekeepers in media and the music industry that have to some extent been bypassed uh, that in the past really was was not pushing rap, but now with other avenues, I think rap has been sort of uh, increasing in popularity from from the ground up. I, I think that's uh, is related to technological changes in in part as well. Right. Any other comments or questions from the floor? We have about 15 more minutes left before we take a break and the plenary session will commence. Oh, yes, uh, Professor de Guzman. Hello, uh, Ola. Uh, uh, nice to hear about your talk. I'm also very interested about music, as you probably have heard from uh, Dr. Pallis. Um, this is not a question, but rather 
rather a curiosity if you if you've been exposed to or are you familiar with Filipino rap flip top so flip top and I think Professor Martinez would also attest to this because I know that she also enjoys watching this kind of um music flip top is basically a rap battle that um that the rappers you know craft uh on cue uh they're basically engaging in conversation so i'm i'm also curious if you are aware of uh those kinds of things also in in sweden and um i wish i could um you know provide subtitles for for flip top because the conversation really is very rich and their play on words really in Filipino is is something that is you know beautiful to 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 watch but um yeah I'm curious if you have that also in Swedish rap thank you uh with, with that having I, I know nothing about Filipino rap of course uh, I assume that there was such a thing uh, but that, that's 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 all uh nor nor have I seen the, the things you, you were alluding to. Uh, but there is a certain element of improvisation that often happens via social media, almost like some form of call and response that 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 people uh, engaged in in rap music uh, on and it on 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 a basis that is 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 almost happening in real time. And and I think that is a little bit what what you were were, were thinking about here. I've, I've seen some of of, of those interesting uh, tendencies, um, and part of that has to do with again the performativity. I think of, of rap music here that that call and response, which is a term that often is associated with um, blues music and its its, its structure. Uh, that that may be connected here. I'm not sure, but particularly then with uh, with regards to uh, either sort of harmless boasting about how how well they rap, or or other things related then to different neighborhoods, or or uh, related to things that then turn into to potential for for violence in 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 these uh, conflicts. Um, so I, I have observed some of those. Uh, tendencies in, in 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 that almost underground social media that 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 happens on a regular basis. Are there any other comments or questions uh, for Dr. Johansson? Or you can also reserve some of your questions later if that would make sense. Uh, Ola, maybe we could make your email available in case there are some questions. And especially since you are based in, in UP at the moment until early December, so there might be a chance to engage with you uh, on music in general, but specific kinds of music in particular, um, if you have some questions. Okay. So if there... Yes, I, I posted my, my email right there in the chat. Um, I don't see it though. Are you sure you send it uh, to the for everyone? Oh, okay. <laughs> you may just have to do it again. Oh, it may have been a direct I, message. Oh, I can. <laughs> sorry. It's all right. Uh, I can post it later too. Yeah. So, um, since there are no more questions or comments, I was wondering if. Uh, I could just ask you instead to kind of give a kind of uh, concluding remarks or as a kind of you know uh, parting words about rap music or or even just music in oh Max you have a question sorry go ahead I think there is a question posted in uh, the chat box yes it said how how was rap music started and I assume that's a reference to United States <clears throat> uh, which. Uh, which was a musical form that developed in the late 1970s in, in New York City uh, in in neighborhoods like uh, like like Brooklyn <clears throat> uh, in the Bronx uh, and um, probably related in in its 
performance to potentially uh, Jamaican style uh, for vocal performances uh, that uh, was associated with Jamaican uh, immigrants to to New York City, uh, and uh, and then also as as a way for uh, MCs during parties to basically not just uh, be disc jockeys and uh, and play music, but also entertain the crowds with their own talk. And that vocal style emerged into with beats rap music in 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 short. Uh, even if I can't really claim to be a perfect historian of of rap music, but in 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 essence, that was the origin of of rap quickly spread to different cities in the U.S. Different styles emerged uh, beyond the U.S. and so forth. Thank you, Ola. Uh, okay, that was not exactly what <laughs> what uh, Dr. Johansson was was trying to say in this thing. It was uh, it was obviously one point of view, you know, about the perpetuation of decadent culture. Um, Dr. Johansson, I wanted you to maybe give some kind of parting or or or. Uh, remarks you know about music or future direction and research you're muted yes oh, yes um well for 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 this particular topic uh here uh, i um i'm just going to do the obvious in, in terms of trying to formulate the issues I've, I've presented here, as well as the previous presentation, in, into something um, publishable. Um, but um, I, I and 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 I'm not sure if if my my main research with regards to music is going to focus on on rap exclusively or or, or much much at all. Uh, but it, it can involve. Uh, uh, other forms of, of, of music. I've, I've researched uh, the relationship between music and, and nature, for example. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I have other, well, some, some topics in mind, but that are a little bit unformulated at this particular point. So I don't have a good answer for you right there, Joseph. That's okay. Uh, maybe as a way of uh, ending this would be to ask a question of... Uh... Um, why you're working also on 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 Korean pop, and uh, uh, you're you're here until early December for that. That that is that is correct. We we uh, we also have a question here about different perspective points that raised um, that was not allowed. Uh, I I don't know if we, the the person can elaborate a little bit on that question. Okay. All right. So um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Johansson, for that wonderful uh, plenary talk. Uh, we will now have a break and we'll come back at 1030 for the start of uh, uh, the panel session. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for, Sir Joe, for coming. Uh, certificate. Oh, yes. There is a certificate that I need to... Uh, hand to Dr. Johansson, and if you can show it in the slide, I'll read it. This is given to Dr. Johansson for sharing his valuable knowledge and experience as plenary speaker with the topic uh, entitled Rap Music and Swedish Landscapes of Violence Through the Eyes of Global Media Consumers at the ICGS 2023 with the theme Performative Geography, Spatialities of Embodiment, Performance, Ideology, and Practice, held virtually on November 24, 25, 2023, at UPD Laman, Quezon City, Philippines, signed by uh, TJ Cipriano and Celeste Hermida, uh, co coordinators of the ICGS, also the president of PGS, Dr. Im uh, Professor Emmanuel Garcia, and yours truly, Joseph Palis, chairperson of geography. Thank you very much, Ola, and we will come back. Is there any other announcement? Thank you so much for the invitation, Joseph. Okay, thank you very much. We will all come back at 10.30.